are going to read the Bible, Genesis chapter 20 and 21 today at a minimum. Some interesting things to go through with Abraham, Abimelech, Sarah, and finally Isaac, then Hagar and Ishmael as well. Let's read the Bible. Genesis chapter 20, anyone want to take a stab at the entire chapter? Who's our entire, Lucille, would you mind? Go ahead. Okay, let's get into your worksheet, Genesis chapter 20. Verse 1, Gerar. This city is in Philistine territory. Abraham felt the same vulnerability as he felt when he went into Egypt. Gaza Strip, if you know current modern-day Middle Eastern politics, where it's located, is the general vicinity vicinity for where the ancient Philistines were concentrated. They expanded more or less during different phases of Old Testament history with more or less regional territory. But if you want to get a locus, you know, a lotsi uh, position when you think about the Philistines, think about the modern day Gaza Strip. Okay? <clears throat> now, Abimelech is the king over that territory. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he's an early Philistine king. Um, the book of Hebrews chapter 11 tells us about the Old Testament people that they were very, very gritty. It calls them strangers and sojourners on earth. Abraham was very, very wealthy but it's clear that as he's interacting with Abimelech, though Abraham is wealthy and of very great prominence, as we'll see at least twice today in his interactions with Abimelech, he's a squatter. He's got to basically take up position in another man's country and another man's boundaries. And so there are political, diplomatic relationships going on here. They're not readily apparent. God doesn't dwell on those because remember, you know, diplomacy between the people of God and foreign nations is not always the number one topic of recorded scriptural history. Nevertheless, when you're thinking about the context of the promise of God as it's bearing out in Abraham and Sarah's life, you want to remember that that's kind of what's going on here. How old was Sarah? 90 years old. So you think the king of Philistia is going to take in a 90-year-old woman because she's just hot <laughs> or beautiful? This is, th this is a political alliance that he's angling towards. So though Abraham is a squatter, you know, speaking very, very casually, it's clear that Abraham held court. He was a very prominent and powerful person Probably, mostly because people knew of his God. And it's clear that Abimelech knew, maybe even believed in the true God because of the way God communicated with him in this chapter. Now, it's, we have to kind of say that with some hesitancy because the Hebrew language when it refers to God as Abimelech's interacting with him, doesn't use some particular um, um, definite articles or names for God that would otherwise give us very clear understanding that, yeah, Abimelech worshipped him alone. But for whatever it is, I mean, normally... God's direct revelation to a pagan ruler. I mean, we don't really have a whole lot of that in the scripture in general, although it does happen. Um, so is it possible Abimelech was a believer? Yeah, it's possible. And to, that, to the point that God actually interacts with him on behalf of Abraham's wife. Now the author here makes a, a, good, a good point, the author of the worksheets. And he says in verse 12 that Abraham passed off Sarah as his sister. Well, is that a lie? Yeah. 
But it was kind of true because technically Abraham was the son of Terah, but Sarah was the daughter of Terah just by a different mom. So they were actually step-siblings, right? So remember that the... Sorry, say again. Well, you, to us, after the Levitical law, but not you to the repopulation of planet earth post-flood okay and the sons and daughters of the semites we've already talked about this but god certainly uh did not prevent people from those kind of relationships back then number one because he's repopulating the earth be fruitful and increase in number and secondly it seems like uh, it, it seems to be a fair assumption that we can make that the sensitivity relationally and emotionally that we might have to that nowadays was it was kind of like veiled from people then until such a time as God said okay no more okay not long I, I keep forgetting I want to bring that big timeline book that we have one day for, for uh, my wife and I she's good at reminding me for but we'll, we'll make sure that we bring this big timeline of world history that we have that intersects with Bible history and we'll lay it out on the table for Bible class here so that when you come before class you can peruse it. But it's really, really fascinating. Christians, when you study the scriptures and we talked about this way back in Genesis 1 um, about four years ago when we were in that section of the Bible. Um, if, if the world is only about 6,000 years old actually, then the overlap of genealogy is, is really not, is really, I mean, the end of Adam's life and the beginning of Noah's life are not that distant, truly. But I'll, I'll bring that, that uh, historical timeline book. It's really fascinating and you can read all the Bible references to it. It's, it's something that you want to peruse over the next few weeks and months and we'll bring it as sort of a, a museum-like display that you can look at ahead of class. But the timelines are relatively condensed. All right, number one, what does it tell you about Abraham that he did the same thing here as he did in chapter 12? <clears throat> he did, but what does it tell you about Abraham that he did it a second time? There are some critics of the Bible who will say, that this is just the same utterance of one account. But we know from the scripture with recorded history that this is a different account because the first account happened with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. This is Abimelech, a king of the Philistine, Philistines. So we know that they're different accounts and that it's a repeated mistake. So what does that tell you about Abraham? Nothing too deep here, just what does it tell you about him? He's a sinner, yeah. So here's a question I want to pursue just a little bit because it came up in our Grace Abounds class Monday night. Did Jesus live a perfect life in your place? Yeah, he did. Did he give you credit in your heart and mind for that so that when God looks at you now, he sees a saint right now? Yes, he did. Don't hesitate. Yes, he did. You did. Don't get to heaven because you try to be good. You don't get to heaven because you're a pretty good Christian. You get to heaven in spite of the fact that you're not good, but that Jesus is your goodness. He is your consummate goodness. He's all you need. He's your sufficient source for salvation. Now, I just talked about the righteousness. Now, let's talk about the forgiveness. Did Jesus die on the cross to forgive all your sins? Did he redeem you from hell? Absolutely. Well, if Jesus accomplished your redemption, how come you keep on sinning? What did his redemption accomplish? If, okay, you're forgiven, but you still sin. I think you're on the right track, but we need to say more. Yeah, eternal life is later, though. Why do we sin right now? Huh? So that we learn a lesson? He, so it, Okay, we, don't, we keep on sinning because we don't learn a lesson? Maybe. We are, more than that, we're conceived into it, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. You're, all, you're saying all true things, for sure. 
But if Jesus redeemed us from our sins, then how come we keep on sinning? Because we're human, all true. Here's, what, here's the way we want to define it. When Jesus redeemed us, what he changed between you and God and what he changed in you as God views you from heaven is your status. The scriptures say in 1 Peter 2, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. In other words, when you are by nature conceived in sin, you are separated from God's family. You are not a child of God, not by conception, not by nature. But when you're baptized or when you convert and come into the Christian faith, when the Holy Spirit converts you by the power of the gospel, what changes is your status. You're no longer a stranger or a sojourner or an alien on earth, at least in respect to God. Your status is now a child, a son or a daughter. And that means that though your status has changed, your habits won't necessarily change. <laughs> you know, your nature has changed but hasn't been replaced. So you still carry that sinful nature with you on this side of heaven, but now you have a new nature. And what has been given to you in addition to the assurance of future redemption in heaven is the power to struggle against sin, not to perfect your spiritual nature. We are not a holiness movement. We are not Methodists. We are not Catholics. We are not Pentecostals. We do not believe that with enough self-discipline and church attendance and money in the plate that we can achieve a sinless walk with God now. But the cool thing is, because of Christ, God looks at you as though your walk with him right now is sinless. Which is why, as Christian Lutherans, we always confess that we are sinner and yet always saint entirely at the same time. The sinner part is almost exclusively the only part that we can see about each other. But God only sees the saint part because of Jesus. Okay? So, you know, I'm saying this for a lot of reasons. I don't want, I don't want to dwell on the point too much, but it's important to understand this. When you, when you read about the inconsistencies of our heroes of faith, it helps you empathize with them because they're just like you. And you're just like them. And on the other hand, when you look in the mirror, just because you're struggling with a certain sin should not, you're still a Christian. You know, just because a certain sin is like kind of, that's the focus right now, it doesn't disqualify you from being a child of God. Uh, I, I maybe didn't appreciate this as much until I was a dad, but like, part of this is just my fault, obviously, because as, as a parent, you get super impatient and frustrated and you kind of get short temperamentally with your your family or your kids. But, um, but would I as a father, when I'm like mad again about something one of my kids did, would I ever consider kicking them out of the family? No, not a chance. And God would never do that with you either. Instead, God even does the opposite. He does what no father or mother has the power actually to do. Not only does God... <laughs> never consider, God never considers kicking you out. Moreover, what he actually does is he steps up the empowerment, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the grace, the uh, spiritual strength so that you can continue the struggle. He doesn't withdraw. He imposes himself, inserts himself even more or at least offers to uh, through the word and sacraments, through your brothers and sisters in Christ. So God not only stays near, uh, he doesn't kick you out, but he comes even closer, you know what I mean? So, and that's really the point we want to build to with this whole chapter. Was Abimelech doing anything right? Well, not really, because he's got, kind of got a harem going on here, and, he's, and politically now he's taking another one into it. 
and an old woman at that, so it's just political posturing. So even if he is a believer, he's very clearly a loose one. Abraham, who is a, the patriarch of the Old Testament, is he acting well here? No. And yet, who does, to whom does God show mercy? And by the way, Sarai, Sarah, I should say, she and Abraham seem to clearly have had a preconceived uh, agreement, like, hey, if we ever get into a politically uh, awkward situation, you tell Pharaoh this, or you tell Abilene like this, and we'll roll with it, okay? For the sake of keeping the peace and kind of, you know, navigating these troubled waters. So Abraham, Abimelech, Sarah, were any of them guilt-free in this context? No way. And yet, how did God interact with them all? Mercifully. Mercifully. He spoke to Abimelech. He didn't smite Abraham or strike Sarah with lightning or say, you know what, I'm sick of you guys. This is the second time I've had to deal with this. No more Isaac for you. You're no longer going to be the family of the promise. God is just so patient and so merciful. If it should ever be, uh, one last point. These are chapters of the Bible that probably aren't very memorable or famous to you, yet they are yet an additional example of how your relationship with God is entirely based on his mercy and not your merit. Abimelech, Abraham, and Sarah did absolutely nothing to deserve God's patient and gracious interaction with them. And yet that's exactly what they received. In spite of, at least for two of them, a a repetitive sin. Okay? So, That's what all of the scriptures are about. They just amplify the patient and gracious, merciful interaction of God with sinful people. Number two, how did Abimelech find out he was planning to marry a married woman? God told him. God interacted with him, which again, how merciful that God should speak with him. You know? According to God, who was guilty? Well, all of them were, but what does he say in the context here? Who does he hold accountable? Who does he hold accountable? Well, kind of, but he speaks to somebody about, he says, you're going to die if you don't change. Who does he say that to? It's a tongue-twisting name, but. Who does he threaten with death if he doesn't let Sarah go? Abimelech, yeah. So God holds Abimelech and his people accountable. Um, It's not that Abraham was innocent, but remember what God is guarding in Abraham. He's not guarding Abraham's conduct here or condoning it. What's he guarding? The promise, yeah. God had just given the promise to Abraham and Sarah, and Sarah was going to conceive and give birth, and... You know, didn't want Abimelech to interfere with that. How did Abraham underestimate the people of Gerar? Yeah, and was there? It seems like there was, at least modestly, yeah, that's right. And by the way, how does Abimelech show if there is some faith, how does he show it? Or or even if there's not faith, how does he still show neighborly hospitality to somebody squatting in his territory? He, He gives Abraham very generous gifts at the end to show, um, you know, diplomacy and hospitality. Number five, Note Abraham's statement about the request he made of Sarah when they left Haran in verse 13. Verse 13 says, When God had made me wander from my father's household, I said to Sarah, This is how you can show your love to me. Everywhere we go, say of me, He is my brother. So they had an arrangement, they had a way that they were going to handle certain things. Okay? 
And though it wasn't completely a lie, it was clearly motivated to be for their advantage and it wasn't a whole, the whole truth either. Anyway, what insight does this give us into Abraham's level of spiritual growth at this time? On the one hand, did he believe in God's promise? Yes, he did. On the other hand, did he, like we all do, have some spiritual blind spots? Yes, he did. Uh, at intermittent times, yeah. Yeah, not like, it didn't overcome his faith like, you know, faith was gone. It's like, you know, this is a, this is a hiccup, yet another one. But it was, it's only the second time it's recorded for us in Scripture, but you wonder in his sojourning on earth how often Abraham might have used this to his advantage, you know. Number six, how might Abimelech's plan to marry Sarah have endangered God's promise to you? If she hadn't been married to, or if she had been married to Abimelech and wasn't pregnant already, I mean, who might her first child have been? A Gentile. A Gentile. So in that sense, uh, here's what we want to think about with regard to, you know, this seems like just a small little thing maybe in the course of ancient history with the heroes of faith. But by actually letting fear encroach upon his faith or letting ulterior motives, diplomacy, politics, or whatever uh, interrupt here his faith, what was Abraham actually putting at risk? The promise, yeah. This was a sin, yes. It was a lie, yes. But he was actually exposing God's promise to failure. On the one hand, personally, we can say the same things about us. When we sin, is it a, a big deal? Well, yes and no. Every sin is serious to God and to your faith. And you put the promise of God in your own heart at risk every time you willfully expose yourself to, you know, to, uh, or give in to temptation. But on the other hand, is it a big deal? On the other hand, well, or on the other hand, is it a big deal? Well, not in the sense of this disqualifies me from the kingdom. You're not falling away from faith every time you sin. Neither was Abraham. But you might be putting the promise in a compromised or lower position for yourself or by purposely sinning, you might also be uh, compromising the message of the promise for other people. Like with Abraham, by withholding 50% of the truth, yeah, is, she, is she my sister? Yeah. I also forgot to tell you, she's my wife. So by purposely withholding information you, or by purposely not speaking up um, by not confessing your, your true beliefs or your faith, you could also be putting someone else's soul at risk too. And Abraham was doing that with certainly Abimelech and, and uh, the promise. Hurting himself and the promise. Any questions on Genesis 20? Abraham and Abimelech. If not, let's get to, finally, the fulfillment of... God's promise to Abraham and Sarah, which is a son. A reader for chapter 21, verses 1 through 21. Chapter 21, verses 1 through 21. Who's game? Sylvia, please, take it away. Excellent. Okay, thank you, Sylvia. Well read. Uh, Genesis chapter 21. This is... Uh, a fascinating chapter for a lot of reasons. I'll give you a little nitty-gritty too with this, but let's look at the note in your worksheets about verse one. It says, the Lord. Notice how the word Lord is spelled in the NAV text. You notice how the O, R, and D are capitalized? The English translations that we use in our church and that we read from, from the pulpit and print in the bulletin um, are will usually 
use this pattern where in the Hebrew language, there's a certain word for Lord that has a specific definition. For example, in the New Testament, you'll see the word Lord used for Jesus too, but it's not capitalized because sometimes the word Lord means master. And sometimes we call God, O Lord, our master. Okay? Well, in that case, even in the Old Testament, it would be spelled L, capital L, lowercase O R and D. But where you see the word or the name Lord used in the Old Testament, and it's capital L and then capital O R and D like this, there's a special name for God, which is Jehovah. And that refers to the definition of God's name, the reference to him as the God of free and faithful grace. Okay? That's very, very important for this context. Look at verse 1. Now the Lord, look how it's spelled, was gracious to Sarah. Sarah who had just lied again. Sarah who had laughed at the idea that the promise would be fulfilled. Sarah who had gotten so impatient that she actually uh, recommended her, son, uh, her husband commit adultery. This Sarah, the Lord was gracious to her. Why? Well, you can know just by reading the text yourself now that you know the definition for the Lord with this spelling. Because he is gracious. He doesn't interact with Sarah because Sarah earned it. He doesn't interact with Sarah because she was beautiful or because she had aged well or because she was Abraham's wife. It's because he is gracious. He is merciful. He is loving. And he does that for free. Sarah was a sinner. And yet she was a beneficiary of this wonderful gift of God. So the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Verse 10, uh, we'll get to that. Slave woman's son, Ishmael, was about 14 years old. We'll get to some of that in a moment. But we already talked about the first two verses of chapter 21, but a couple of things. Uh, we already talked about the gracious aspect of it, but the fact that God did what he had promised, he, he allowed Sarah to bear the son at the very time that he had promised. That's, that's interesting. You want to remember that God always follows through. In our lives, we don't, we don't necessarily always get to see the end of, like we don't always get to see the closure for things. Let me give you an example. Uh, you know, years ago, we had a dear friend and member of our congregation named Dorothy Wilson who went to heaven and she was 40 years old, right? Or was she 41? She had just turned 40, right? Um, she goes to heaven after a relatively short, like a year-long fight with cancer. We were all, at least I was, at least maybe naively optimistic at the beginning, like this wasn't going to take her life, but it would be a hard, hard battle. Well, then she, she went to heaven, and, uh, and right now on planet Earth, we have some promises of God that can comfort us and can hold us fast. And we know for a fact she's in heaven, which is also comforting, right? But we, not until we get to heaven, perhaps, might we completely understand why God and his wisdom decided to take her then as opposed to maybe when she was 80 or 60. So we don't really have, at least right now, the closure to our questions. Not fully. We have some indication and assurances from God's promises uh, the, the Bible text that we used for her funeral was Isaiah 57, where God says, sometimes the righteous are taken away and it's to spare them from further evil. You know, might that have been the reason why? Well, I can't say for sure because I don't know the mind and heart of God. Maybe God just decided, I want, I want Dorothy to have ecstasy right now. <laughs> I, just, I just want her to be home, you know. Whatever is the rationale for God, we can't know that right now, which is sort of like, uh, we, on the one hand, we kind of feel like it's a little unsatisfying. And it's the same thing, like, when you're in your early 30s, you've, you've got a great degree from some big-name university, and you've got the debt to prove it, and then you, you lose your first job, which you thought was going to be the job for which you could climb the ladder and, and make your millions and 
ride off into the sunset someday in retirement, and you know what I mean? And then you lose your job, and you're like, wait, why would God ever allow this? And your life takes a totally different direction, maybe good, maybe bad, but never do you actually get the, the clouds to part and a voice from the heavens to say, this is why I allowed it. This is why I allowed this to happen. And you're like, I kind of wish God would do that sometimes. The reason I bring up these things is because the promises we have from God are intended to be enough. They're intended to assure you that God works out all things for your good, that God sufficiently has provided in his word the kind of comfort and closure that you need at least for now. So that's why we, you know, we preach and preach and preach and preach and kind of badger you with get into the word, get into the word, get into the word because the more you're in the word, the more peace and uh, the more peace from God you'll have to help you cope with all these uh, uncertainties that we, we have to navigate in life. It doesn't mean that you won't grimace and that you won't suffer and that you won't cry, but it does mean that you'll have the right perspective as you do, you know? And for those who die with that perspective, that worldview of Christ and his promises and how he, how he delivers and follows through like he did with Abraham and Sarah, we know that we will get closure one day. If not now, it will come later. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, now I see but a poor reflection, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. In other words, a lot of questions will be answered in heaven, you know, and uh, we will not be left hanging ever there. For now, what would faith be if God told us the answer to every question or even just appeared right in front of us for everything? Then, then we would build then we would build our trust for him on, you know, what we could see and touch and not on his words and what was invisible. And that's, again, waxing on here, that's what Hebrews tells us. Faith is being sure of what we hope for, which is invisible, and certain of what we don't see. That's what faith is. And God justifies us, he makes us righteous, and he brings us home to heaven, not because we know every answer to a question, but because we have faith. So, I'm not, I'm not trying to compliment Abraham and Sarah here necessarily or criticize you or me. I'm just trying to point you to who God is and his character. If he promises you that in all things, all things, not just the good things, he works for the good of those who love him, Romans 8, 28, then he really does. And it must be true regardless of how well you understand what's going on in the present. So I hope that can be a little bit of encouragement, but uh, Abraham and Sarah probably went through the same roller coaster ride. You know, they're 90 years old, they're childless, and then God says you're going to have a kid. <laughs> okay then, you know. I mean, even before they got to that reassurance that God was going to fulfill a promise, how do you suppose they were, you know, God said he was going to be our shield, or very, we're gonna make a, he's going to make us into a great nation, and, and here we are. We're aging out. Well, so that there could be no mistaking that this was by God's grace alone and not by their merit, not by their participation, not by their church attendance or not by their obedience to what God commanded them to do. Go, settle in, you know, near Gerar and make an alliance with Abimelech. It had nothing to do with Abraham and Sarah. It had everything to do with God and his grace and mercy. The God of free and faithful grace. And he followed through. Okay. Number three, Sarah, tell Abraham to send Hagar and Ishmael away. <clears throat> well, just refer to verse 9. Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham was mocking. Oh, look, a couple things. First of all, let's go backwards, okay? Go to verse 6. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. There are some awesome little Hebraisms, we call them. They're like, they're like, 
their uh, ironies. If you read the Bible, uh, there's a, there's a, I, I preached a sermon on this once. It was based on an article that my dad wrote for the Ford and Christ years and years and years ago. But the, the question is, does God have a sense of humor? Well, if you read the Bible, you realize, not really. God is very serious about the message. On the other hand, there's a ton of irony in the Bible, which is fun. And it's not as though God is trying to, you know, make a joke of something. But it, it do, the ironies really do a good job of amplifying, again, the character of God and his, his grace. Let me give you one example. Um, in the, was it the prophet Elisha or Elijah? I can't remember. Naaman? Was that Elisha? It was Elisha, yeah. Or not the prophet. The prophet Elisha, the commander Naaman, who is this, like, when you think of an Old Testament commander, you don't think of like Andy Miller, 6'1", 172 pounds, dripping wet. You think of like David and the statue over at Caesar's Palace. <laughs> you know, like this 6'4", six, 6'5", six, kind of like warrior. You don't, be, you don't become the leader of men who are wielding swords in battle and surviving them all, all these battles, unless you are a valiant warrior. So Naaman is this incredible commander. He tells people where to go and they go. And he's got this rapport. Well, a little girl tells him where to wash. Just a little girl. Just a little girl tells Naaman where to wash. And then um, Naaman does, and it's just a little water. Just a little water that heals this great big commander, you know? Uh, I want to read it exactly here as I found it. This was an insight by a, one of my, uh, let's see here. Here, here's what he says. Oh. A little girl sends the great and mighty Naaman to see the prophet and to be washed in the Jordan. And then when he comes out of the Jordan waters, his skin is restored like the flesh of a little child. So it's a little girl that tells him where to go and what to do. <laughs> Mighty Naaman. And then when he's restored, it's, his flesh is restored from its leprosy like the flesh of a little child. So it doesn't seem like a big deal and you almost skip over it if you're just reading the Bible because that's what you're supposed to do, you know. But it's such a beautiful little irony that the first shall become last and the last shall become first. Well, what did Sarah do chapters ago at the announcement that she was going to have a kid in her old age? She laughed. And, and what was the nature of her laughing? Mockery. Skepticism. And now she's not saying that people are going to, everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. She's not talking about the mocking laugh anymore. Now she's talking about joy and praise. Celebration. And she names her son Isaac, which means he laughs. So this is a, just another little irony that uh, bespeaks God's mercy and just awesomeness again. Yeah, I love it, yeah. That'd be a great sermon theme. Yeah, God has the last laugh, I love it. Well, now, furthermore, the one who was mocking the promise of God with her laughter notices on the top of page 28, if you're in the same single column Bible as me, but it's chapter 21, verse 9, Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham was mocking. It's important for us to clarify something here because remember the tension that existed between Sarah and Hagar because, you know, of what happened with the, the adultery in Abraham. This, this, it would be easy for us to read this as, well, of course Sarah still holds some, you know, bitterness in her heart towards Hagar and her son too. And now her son is 14 and you know how middle-aged schoolboys can be, you know? This is like, he's an easy target. But the Hebrew word for mocking has, and, and the, the Hebrew and Greek languages are able to convey this with much more concision 
and brevity than our English language. In English, I have to say, he kept on mocking. But in Hebrew, it's only one word and it's given in a certain tense of language. So the tense in Hebrew indicates that this was a perpetual thing. And that Ishmael was not so much mocking Isaac, although he was, he was mocking sort of like everything about the concept of Isaac, the, the old age conception and birth of Isaac, the, the uh, special favor that Isaac got as, you know, the miraculous son of Abraham and Sarah, the bearer of the promise. All that is sort of wrapped up here in mocking so that it shows you that Sarah wasn't just nitpicking because she was bitter and being petty again now that she's got her kid and Hagar has hers, you know. This is something that was creating a toxic environment in the home but about the promise itself. And it was mocking those who were the inheritors of it. Therefore, God did not intervene to say, no, Abraham, allow Ishmael to stay. Though it hurt Abraham because he loved Ishmael unconditionally also as a father, it hurt Ishmael, it hurt Abraham to have to think about sending Ishmael away. Okay? Now, how come we can say all this? Well, we can say all this, yes, because of the Hebrew verb for mocking, but we can also say it with confidence because of what? the rest of the Bible teaches us. So put your finger or a bookmark in Genesis chapter 21 and turn in the New Testament to Galatians chapter 4. Verses 21 through 31. Uh, For you, Sylvia, it'll be 1772. 1772. Galatians 4, 21 to 31. It's on your worksheet too. Under number three. Okay. <clears throat> I'll read this. Hagar and Sarah is referred to by the Apostle Paul wrote this now. And remember, the Apostle Paul was a Jew by birth, but a Gentile by citizenship. Okay? Tell me, you who want to be under the law, and remember what the law means. The law is thinking that your relationship with God on any level hinges upon your behavior or your obedience. Okay? I know that sounds real formal and preachy and pastory to say, but this is human nature for us to think that our comfortability level with God is determined by our contribution to the relationship. It's how our regular marriages are. You kinda, you know, if you want to have a good marriage, what does it take between you mutually? It takes some work, <laughs> doesn't it? And so we naturally carry that over into our relationship with God. If you want to be a good parent, what does it take? It takes some work. You know, um, so we, we naturally transfer that over to our relationship to God and we think, you know, for our relationship to God to be sound and healthy, it takes some work on our part. Well, God says, no, it's pretty much a unilateral one-way street from heaven to your heart. It's all me. Anything else is law-based. And that's what Paul is getting at here. And he uses Hagar and Sarah by reference to illustrate the point. Tell me, you who want to be under the, bird, uh, to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh. What does he mean by that? Well, Sarah said, go and do. God said, I promise you something. Abraham and Sarah thought, we have to fulfill the promise with our own effort. Remember? We just read that. 
a few weeks ago. So his son by the slave woman, Ishmael, was born according to the flesh. But his son by the free woman, make no mistake about it, there's no other way it could have happened other than by a miraculous conception, which is what God brought about. The, his son by the free woman was born of the result of the, as a result of the divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The, woman represent, the women excuse me, represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai, which is, look at me, the pointy finger, the wooden spoon, don't you know, right? That's what so many religions are, as we've discussed many times. Every other religion, even many other Christian denominations are all about that pointy finger. You got to tithe now. You better be in a small group Bible study, you know. We're going to track your church attendance for the sake of, uh, you know, your attendance at our, at our, at our school. Um, whatever it is, you, you, you go back to your own background religiously and go down the list of little rules that your church forced you to obey. Now, it doesn't mean a church can't have rules so long as they come from God's word in the New Testament. It doesn't mean that a church can't have traditions. It doesn't mean that a church can't have uh, a decorum or a uh, decency and good order. There are certain things from God's word that matter on those points. But none of those things have anything to do with how your relationship with God is established or maintained. Okay? So, that's what Paul is getting at here. Now look, one covenant is from Mount Sinai, which is the pointy finger, the law, and bears children who are to be slaves because everyone who thinks that the relationship with God has to do with their obedience is actually not a child of God, but rather a slave. That's Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. And what Paul is saying, because he was a Pharisee, he's saying, all of my people who are Jewish, who don't believe that Jesus fulfilled all of the Old Testament, they are now still caught in Mount Sinai, they think that the relationship with God still has to do with obedience to the rules. My brothers and my sisters who are of my, my own race are essentially lost. They're, do- they're sons and daughters of Hagar, sadly. Not children of the promise, but look at verse 26. But the Jerusalem that is above and free, that is heaven, she is our mother. For it is written, be glad, barren woman. You who never bore a child, shout for joy and cry aloud. You who are never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. Why? Because we didn't contribute to our faith or salvation either. God simply called us by the gospel and here we are. So if you're a Christian, (laughs) thank the Lord. Because he chose you in spite of the fact that you and I didn't deserve it, he chose you because he's the Lord of free and faithful grace. He just, he loved you. But there are some who God wanted to save too who rejected what he has done. Okay, so verse 29. At that time, the son born according to the flesh, Ishmael, persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It's the same now. In other words, Christians are still mocked by children who are, or are people by, uh, by people who are slaves to the law. But what does scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. There, in other words, uh, nobody who thinks that they can get to heaven or to a higher power with rules is going to go to the new Jerusalem. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. So whenever you're tempted to think that your relationship with God needs to be improved exclusively by your behavior, that's when you want to take that proud thought that is completely hinging on you and bring it to the feet of the cross in Jesus Christ and remember his promise and his love for you. God's character, his grace never changes, ever. Um, Think about the, you remember the parable of the prodigal son upon which the hymn Amazing Grace was based and written? Luke chapter 15, the parable of the prodigal son, 
the one son goes away and lives it up. He's sleeping with prostitutes, spending all his money and his, his inheritance, and what happens? He ends up hitting rock bottom. I mean, you can see it because he's eating what the pigs do. And the older son who does what's right. Remember this now. The older son who stayed home and did what was right was actually just as far removed from the love of his father too. Because all these years he said, quote, I've been slaving away for you, dad, and you never threw a feast for me. In other words, look at all I've done to earn your love. Both sons were effectively lost. One by Obeying the law, he was lost. And the other, by disregarding and, you know, splurging sin. Well, where was the father all the way along? Right where he had always been. Showing both of his sons grace and mercy. And so, when the younger son comes home, I mean, this is an often forgotten part of the story, but the, the Bible says about that Luke chapter 15 account with the parable of the prodigal son that while he was still a long way off, his father ran out to him and met him, threw his arm around him and kissed him. In other words, you get the impression from the verbiage there that every day the, son was out on the, front, or the father was out on the front porch just scanning the horizon waiting for his son to come back because he still loved him. <laughs> he never stopped. Meanwhile, the son who was at home still had everything at his disposal. The father never took it away. You see? So a lot of times people will say, well, which son do you identify with? And I say always, both. Because there are times in my faith where I, I think that God should love me more because I've been such a good devotional habit guy. You know, I've been reading my Bible every little day like a good little Christian and, and look at me and I haven't used a swear word for three years, you know, and look how, look how good I am. And that is a condemnable arrogance. On the other hand, there are times where I'm in a mood and I'm, you know, grumpy towards people and I'm inconsistent with my work or inconsistent with my devotional life or snappy with my kids and I go to bed at night afraid to pray. Because I'm like, why should he listen? I pretty much suck at my faith right now. You know? And you feel that way. Well, either I'm the lost son on the one hand or I'm the, the arrogant, look what I've done for you son on the other. And both put me outside the realm of God's grace. And what God is saying is, if you would just stop obsessing about yourself and whether you're good or bad, and look at me and my son, Jesus, and the cross, then you would understand where, where our relationship is truly forged. In me! <laughs> so I hope, this is a repetitive refrain, I know, when it comes to the messaging of our church and the proclamation of our church, but it's the essence of the Bible and of true Christianity. And I hope for as long as you live on earth, it will be the reason why you either attend our church or one like ours. Because no matter who's the pastor or what the class is, this is the assurance we have that in life and in death, Christ is our all in all, okay? It never, never hinges on you and you, you want it that way because then there's just no pressure and there's no guilt and you can just live joyfully, you can have fun with your Christian life, you can eat, drink, and be merry in Christ because tomorrow we live. Tomorrow we live. Right? Okay, let's wrap it up real, real quick. We already went through number three. Um, we already talked about with number two how the promise was at stake, essentially. That's how the Lord helped Abraham do the difficult thing of sending Ishmael away. And he took care of Hagar and Ishmael along the way. Remember that God, let's see, <clears throat> Okay, number four. One of the elements of God's promise to Abraham was that God would make his name great. How do verses 22 to 32 show that? We didn't read that yet, so let's just skip that for now. Uh, one of the things I wanted to just say is that God was really merciful and gracious to Hagar and Ishmael too because Hagar, when she left, I mean, remember, it's not as though she was, tra she's, she's a single mom. 
She's a single mom traveling with a 14-year-old who's not a man yet. And you're being banished from a guy who's pretty wealthy. You know, Abraham was well-to-do, so Hagar and Ishmael have been well provided for, and now you're going to travel some God-forsaken road, and how are you going to fend for yourself in ancient times? This is a very, very scary thing for a woman and a young adolescent boy to go through. But God had promised Ishmael that he would make him into a great nation, okay? And that he would have a lot of descendants. And that was a promise that Hagar could hang her hat on too. And so when the going got tough and she was thinking he was in a bad way and he was going to die, of course she got scared and sorrowful because he was in, you know, he was doing poor. But you can tell it was not just an angel of God, but the angel of God. Why? Because in verse 17, the angel of God called to her, that definite article there. And then at the end of verse 18, for I will make him into a great nation. So you know that the angel of God in that circumstance is the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ, who is reassuring Hagar that she, is going, that she and her son are going to survive and be provided for by God. So God is being merciful to them too. It's 12 o'clock. I think we're going to call it quits there. Um, we already talked about number five under application for Sarah's laughter, so we don't need to cover that. What we'll do is we'll get into Genesis chapter 22 next time, but we'll begin at, at verse 22 of 21 just so that we wrap up that quick section about Abimelech again. And then uh, we're going to get into a wonderfully famous section of the scriptures next time where, okay, you've got Isaac now, and when he's an adolescent, God says, yeah, go kill him, go sacrifice him. What kind of God would ever say that or do that? That's what we'll talk about next time. All right, any questions from today? If not, let's close with a blessing and you can be on your way. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. God bless your week. Oh, uh-huh.